everybody, it's Jay Robey. I wanted to do another positional practice video today, and I took this position from a blindfold game that was played uh, between Aronian and Toploff, and Aronian was playing white in this position. He was rated 2741, and uh, Toploff was rated 2813. Um, so how these positional practice videos work is they focus exclusively on generating candidate lines. So in other words, what you want to do is you want to take a look at the position, it's white to move, and you want to try to envision all your move options and what your opponent would play in response to the moves that you make. And you, and you try to carry that as far as you can in your mind and then stop and then assess the position that you have in your mind and make the decision if it either A, maintains equality, or B, gives you a slight positional advantage. Um, that's the ultimate goal. And you might go through three, four, five uh, potential move options and some might be rather lengthy and some might be very short because you realize right away that um, either it's going to hurt your position or your opponent would never play a move like that in the position. Now I also want to say right off the top, be very careful to be extremely critical of the moves that your opponent could potentially make because if it's going to help your position, if they don't have to make that move, they won't. Um, if they do, it'll be kind of like a positional blunder. Also, if this is something new for you, I recommend that you write your moves down. That way you can input them into the computer after and just kind of take a look at, um, you know, if you made any mistakes uh, in terms of positional strength yourself. Um, so how we're going to do this is I'm going to go through the moves that I saw in the position first. Uh, then we'll take a look at what the computer thought was the best move. And then we'll wrap things off with what was actually played by Aronian uh, in the game. So if you want to, go ahead and pause the video now. Take all the time that you need and uh, generate those lines. And uh, I'm going to get started here. So uh, Black just moved the queen to f4 in this position. And I said a little bit earlier that it's an equal position, and it is. Uh, but it's also a very dynamic position. Um, there's a lot going on here. First First of all, uh, you can see that the reason that the black queen came down was to pin this bishop um, to the queen because this bishop is attacking the rook currently on a8. Um, so black played a very good move now just to bring the queen down to f4, basically taking the option away from the bishop to take that rook, and at the same time attacking the pawn on f5. Um, now if we take a look at the pawn structures on both sides, black definitely has a better pawn uh, structure currently. It's got uh, two pawn islands, they're all connected. Uh, white has doubled up pawns on the h-file. I don't see this too often, but it does crop up from time to time. Um, and then white is left with all these isolated pawns on the queen side. Um, but nonetheless, it's still an equal position in terms of overall strength. Uh, one of the things that did jump out to me though about the position uh, was this bishop on c4. I think this is a very strong and well-placed bishop. Uh, that has a lot of options. Uh, first of all, it's in you know it's influencing uh, e2 here, attacking this pawn. Uh, so white has to constantly think about that. Uh, but it's also got a lot of options and directions to go to. So it's definitely not hemmed in by any stretch of the imagination. Now, when we take a look at the remainder of the pieces, both sides have connected rooks, and uh, both sides have kings that are you know definitely not in the in the most ideal positions. Uh, both sides have open diagonals to the kings, um, and it's definitely not a solid castle position on either side side of the board. So uh, both sides kind of struggle with that. So the first thing that came to my mind in the position was how can I maintain the attacking position? Um, in other words, how can I you know, keep the pressure up? And the first move that came to my mind was uh, queen to g2. And uh, the reason that I thought of queen to g2 is because now this bishop's no longer pinned to my queen um, and I'm still attacking the rook on a8. So I had to think, okay, well, what would my opponent play in this position? And I thought rook to uh, d8 would be a good move because it grabs a d-file. Um, and then also, if this rook ever gets down to d2, um, it can influence a lot of pressure along this rank. Um, so I figured that that would be a, you know, a likely move that my opponent could possibly make in the position. Um, from here, I thought that what I would do is I would capture the pawn now on g6. And if my opponent were to take back with the pawn, um, this is checkmate and it's game over. Now, of course, like I said earlier, um, you know, your opponent's not going to give you the game. Um, so there has to be another move option for my opponent. So if we go back to this position, my opponent definitely has another move and it could be rook to g8. And that's basically pinning that pawn down now. Um, instead of taking my pawn, I can just play the rook over and now my queen is under attack if I were to capture again with the pawn. Um, so from here, I thought I could play queen to g5, landing the check. If my opponent does the queen trade, which uh, really doesn't have much of a choice, I can capture back, and when my opponent takes the pawn on g6, I could push my pawn up to h4. And I thought a little bit about this, and... 
I just didn't like it because, first of all, like I said earlier, this file is now firmly under control by this rook. Um, also, this bishop is attacking the pawn on e2, and it wouldn't take much for my opponent to get um, another rook backing up this bishop attacking the pawn, um, which could lead to some potential problems. I think one of the reasons why I initially really liked this line idea when I thought about it um, was because I was correcting some issues with my pawns. Um, but um, like I've said in my other videos, I've been working a little bit on tunnel vision in that um, you know you want to try not to uh, you, you want to try not to get too married to an idea just because uh, uh, you're happy with one potential result from it. Um, so anyway, uh, let's go back to uh, Queen to F4. That was one of the lines that I thought of. Another one was uh, flat out taking the pawn on G6, and I figured that my opponent from here could play Rook to E8, giving another attacker uh, to the pawn on E2, from which I could play now G7, attacking the Rook. And from here, I, I kind of envisioned my opponent blocking that pawn from coming down by playing Rook to G8, and from here I could play Rook to G2, preparing to um, move my A1 Rook over to G1, um, and giving this pawn a lot of support. Um, and I figured from this uh, this position, you know, it might be playable. So I was, uh, you know, I wasn't too uh, unhappy with this. That being said, that was kind of the end of uh, uh, my thought process on that line. Uh, so I'll go back to Queen to F4. And another idea I had, I wanted to kind of think of some different ones because I had been focusing so much on um, launching an attack. I wanted to take a look at my other options, even if it's just quickly, just to see, you know, what, what the position would end up looking like. Um, so I figured I'd try uh, E3. Uh, pushing the pawn up, attacking the queen, um, from which my pawn here drops on f5. And then after I play queen to g3, my opponent can play rook again to d8. And this, this rook to d8 is, you know, is kind of a, a kink in my side throughout the whole thought process because not only does it grab the file like I've been talking about, but just having a rook on this second rank is, you know, it's, it's something that I would like to avoid if at all possible. But nonetheless, the line dropped upon anyway, so I pretty much stopped thinking about it there. Um, so the next one I thought of was um, going up for uh, a5 push with my pawn, just to just to kind of see, you know, if I could figure out mentally what would happen. And I figured my opponent could once again play the rook to e8, uh, giving another attacker on the pawn there. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, it wasn't looking too good. I thought I could. Uh, push the pawn up, attacking the queen, but once again I lose a pawn. Uh, so that was no good. Uh, so then I took a look at uh, rook a to d1. Um, thought about maybe, you know, trying to get that uh, that file for myself. And I figured my opponent might play rook over again to e8, giving another attacker on that pawn, from which I could play now queen to uh, g3, um, offering up the queen trade, uh, but there goes that pawn again. So I didn't really see much point in, in going down that road any farther. So that was pretty much the extent of my lines. I kind of gave myself a time limit. I wanted to uh, kind of mimic a real a real game situation. Um, so I'm going to go back to Queen to F4. Now we're going to take a look at what the computer thought was the best line in this position. And uh, it's an interesting one, actually. Ribka 3 um, saw an interesting uh, play here. Now it doesn't uh, achieve a, a large advantage by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it's definitely something that I didn't think about at the time. And the first move that Ribka played was Rook up now to G5. And from here, play continued. Bishop up now to d5, because remember, this bishop is still pinned. And then rook over to g1, giving more support to this rook. And then the bishop captures, queen takes, queen takes. And when the pawn retakes now, um, Ribka played the rook over to g8, supporting that pawn farther. Now, in terms of overall positional strength, it's about a half a point in black's favor. So I'm sure the computer could probably eke out a win um, in this position. Ribka 3 is uh, wonderful at doing uh, things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, it's um, it's not a, a huge advantage at this point. Um, so not even Ribka could derive a, a crushing advantage um, from the initial starting position. Now, let's go back and let's see what Aronian actually played in the position. Um, so facing queen on f4, Aronian decided to play the rook over to f1 basically taking the pin off of that bishop. Uh, from here, black plays rook over to e8, and then white captures the pawn on g6. Black recaptures, and now white plays queen over to g2, and you can see that there's a checkmate that's threatened in this position. Uh, so from here, black brings a queen back to d6, protecting that pawn, and then white takes the pawn on h5. And now this bishop, again, cannot be captured uh, in this position because um, g7 would be checkmate. Uh, so from here, black takes a rook on f1, white recaptures, and then black attacks the bishop now on g5. And as interesting as this position look, it's still pretty much dead on equal. 
so it was a very interesting sequence of moves that were played. Um, so just to recap from the starting position, um, you know, what I probably would have went with myself looking at the position and, and coming up with my own candidate lines, I probably actually would have taken um, FXG6 like that with my pawn and got to the resulting line um, or hopefully got to the resulting line where at least I had a good backup on my pawn here on uh, G7 and a playable position. Um, but that being said, the computer again thought that rook to g5 was good, and then Aronian, of course, uh, brought the rook over to f1. So in this case, I didn't uh, get the grandmaster move, um, so I'm looking forward to hear if you did or not. And I'm also looking forward to your feedback on this particular series as well. It's one of my favorite ones to do because I think that over time, um, it's a good gauge of uh, tracking your improvement in chess. Uh, so definitely looking forward to your feedback, so take care, hope you enjoy the video, and we'll see you next time.